Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, I'm the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Ray Heipel, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. Pete Giacalone, South Hills Assembly God Church, Bethel Park, PA. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level in the North Hills area. Pastors, thank you for being with us. I appreciate this. I appreciate hearing what the men of God have to say about the Word of God, about mm. your hard questions. And today on Hard Questions, we're talking about everything from God giving us over to our sins to asking, does God get angry with us? But let's start here first. What does I can do all things through Christ really mean? Well, you know, this is one of those famous plaques that we yeah. see on the wall. And I forget who it was that said, you know, when we take these verses and we put them on the wall, mm -hmm. that our wall wallpaper needs to say context, context, context. <laughs> yes. And, yes. and so, you know, to me, I think that that's the important thing here. And when we read, it, Paul says mm -hmm. in verse 11, not that I have respect of want, mm -hmm. for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. He said, I know how mm -hmm. both to abase and how to abound everywhere in all things I am instructed to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. So he's talking about life circumstances mm -hmm. that he's going through. You know, he's not talking about, you know, I'm playing in a football game and I, I want to run four touchdowns and Christ is going to help me. You know, he's not talking about, you know, me being able to lift uh, 600 pounds. I, you know, he's talking about life situations. And in particular, he's talking about, you know, being hungry and being full, being exalted, being put down. And he said that whatever state that I'm in, he said, I realize that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That whatever I'm going through, that Christ will give me the strength to be able to deal with the situations of life. So I don't think that this is a verse. Again, I know we, we, we say this, and I think that there might be other verses that we can go to to support that theory, but I don't think what in this context, He's not saying, well, I can do all things through Christ. You know? yeah, I just have to tell you this little story. My dad was really into some power of positive thinking kind of teaching when he was younger. And he put that on the mirror in the bathroom. I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me. But he even came around later and realized I was kind of misusing that. I was yeah. misusing that just for, you know, I can do like as, a, as something to pump you up rather yeah. than as what it really means. And I think, as you said, context, context. And this is where we get our, our followers in trouble is when, you know, uh, someone who has no talent at all gets up and says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and wants to Don't be... Don't talk a, about me that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and wants to do a, a song in church or, or, or wants to play on the piano but has absolutely no skills whatsoever. To me, that's taken out of context. This is, as J. Vernon McGee used to say, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is true life. Uh, when I have much, I can endure with Christ. When I have little... I can endure with Christ. So I, I believe we need to keep it back in context. Very good. Well, yeah. says, I believe that you can do all things. Like I know a guy that um, in my Bible college, uh, somebody prayed over him and he went down and just played the organ, never took a note, never took a lesson ever in his life. Wow. This is the thing. I can do all things through Christ. Did he strengthen you? If he didn't strengthen you, you can't do it. <laughs> so it's real simple. So I believe that there are times that God will step in and give you an ability that you don't have yourself. Uh, you can do all things, but the question is, did he give you the grace okay. to be strengthened to do that? And a lot of times just with the positive thinking, well, you can quote that all day long, but he's yeah. like, it, it's, it, that's still your might. <laughs> and if it's not him empowering you, like my friend, his name was Jamie, he's a pastor today. And I told him one day, I said, how in the world did you do it? He said, my dad prayed over me. And I was in the middle of a service and he said, I went down and I just started playing. And I played with him in college. Wow. And I said, did you, ever, he can't read a note, nothing. He can just hear it. He said, one day it just took over and God gave him the ability. But that is very, very rare. Exception, not the rule. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with Dr. Glaze. I think uh, this is to the Christian, first of all. It's not to anybody else. Uh, and what it means is that any situation God puts you in, you're, you can handle as a believer. God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Uh, he'll always be with you. So like, and, and you gave the right context. Paul said, if I'm hungry, right. if I'm full, if I'm, you know, abased, if I'm abounding, whatever it is, wherever, whatever God leads me in his providence, I can still serve him. 
-hmm. I can do all, th I can serve him in any way. You know, it doesn't mean I can go back in time, I can be Superman, I can become God. Um, that's all things. No, it means I can do whatever God requires of me in this situation. Yeah, yeah that's a good definition. I'd always much rather abound than abase, personally. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> All right, let's go to our next question. Why is it, why is the Old Testament important for us today? Uh, uh, Pete, I want to start with you, but I've got some, some thoughts about this okay, too, but go okay. ahead. Well, first of all, you know, we want to separate, it's God's word. You've, and I want to start off this way. You've got Old Testament, New Testament, that's what makes up the Bible. And we have the, the saying, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And, and it's, uh, it's just as inspired. So the Old Testament is inspired because I do hear some people saying, well, you, you know, if you don't have a concept of the Old Testament, you will not fully understand the book of Hebrews. Right. You might as well just throw the book of Hebrews completely away. And then the Old Testament, there's 351 prophecies fulfilled in the New Testament about Christ being the Messiah. 300, and I've got that all written out. And so you stop and think about, it. so if we get rid of that, we have nothing really to hang our hat on. We need all scripture. All right, then it says the Old Testament presents the, uh, the character of God. Mm -hmm. The complete character of God is in the Old Testament. Uh, a couple more. The Old Testament provides a historical setting out of which Christianity and the New Testament emerge. You know, well, you said it. We don't really understand how Christianity has to, uh, and the Messiah comes out of, unless we understand the Old Testament. I think, and maybe we could define it th this way a little bit, is I think people wrestle with, what about all these commands? Am I supposed to follow these now? Or am I supposed to follow some and not other ones? Or am I supposed to, I don't have to follow any of them? And if I'm supposed to follow some, which ones am I supposed to follow? So I mean, that's, that's where I come down and wrestling with it. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Pete said. Um, and you know, the, 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 the Christ of the New Testament stands upon right. the pages yes. of the Old Testament. Jesus says 50 different, more than 50 times, it is written, it is written. He's never talking about the New Testament because it wasn't written yet. Right. He's always talking about the Old Testament and he talks about himself. He says uh, in, at the end of the Gospel of Luke, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all the things must be fulfilled which are written of me in the law of Moses and the prophets mm. and the Psalms. That's the Tanakh, the, yeah. the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Katuvim, the three sections of the Old Testament. But to get at your point, uh, Tom, uh, yeah, yeah, there are things that are fulfilled by mm. Christ. You know, yeah. um, Christ is the Lamb of God, therefore we don't offer lambs anymore. Right. But it was important to know that why they offered lambs, right. you know, that, that these things were placeholders. I like what you said before, Jay, about how, you know, it, it's not that those, the blood of those animals paid for sins, but they were like a placeholder until Jesus came to fulfill what that picture represented. But, you know, all the context of Christ being who he was, the Passover, uh, and turning that into the New Testament. So, yeah, there are things fulfilled that we don't do anymore, but they pointed to Jesus. There were things that had to do with Israel. Uh, we're not Israel, you know, so we don't have judges and we don't have uh, rulers who are kings of the house of David and so forth. That was just for Israel. But again, it's important that we know that because Jesus is the son of David, you yeah, know, so even good. that is important. So, you know, none of the Old Testament is to be jettisoned or, to, you know, yeah, things are fulfilled that we don't do, but there's even customs in the new, you know, like women wearing head coverings and so forth that we don't do or, or the holy kiss, you know. Well, yeah. I mean, th those are things that might, might sit uh, in a certain the place. The doctor love uh, piped up on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any, any other thoughts on this? Yeah, real quick, uh, Pastor Pete, you mentioned something good. I think if you really want to understand why the Old Testament is important, I think the greatest study is the book of Hebrews right. uh, because it really gives how, G it's really the book of better things. Re exactly. It's all about how Jesus was better. So if you look at that, you see like even uh, David talking about, you will not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. I mean, it goes through all the different types of things where people, w what the life was like before and what life is like in grace now under yeah. the New Testament principles. Mm -hmm. So in order to really develop an appreciation for that, you have to go back and see all of that. And then you can see really how great of a salvation, which is mentioned in Hebrews, that we really have as believers. That's great, that's great. Well, we're gonna take a quick break. And when we come back in just 60 seconds, we're gonna ask, does God get angry with us? Welcome back to Hard Questions. Our next question is this, at what point does God 
give us over to our sins. Pastor Jay, I'm going to start with you. Maybe you can even define what, what they're talking about there. It's a point of where God gives you a Burger King anointing. Have it your way. Oh. Uh, that's why I'm going to put it, I'm going to give it some different ver uh, <laughs> verbiage there. God pretty much says, okay, if you want it, yeah. yep, here it is. You know, we don't realize the, the dangers of that when God says, have it your way. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when you're trying to tell somebody, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. I was watching a mafia show one time and uh, there was a guy there and he kept trying to go after this big guy and the guy's holding him back, going back. Finally, the guy opened the door and says, go in. Yeah. You really want it? Go ahead and have it your way. And if, because he knows if he goes in, he's going to get killed. Mm -hmm. He knows that guy's going to kill him. And so what God does is he finally washes his hands. And we don't realize sometimes uh, it's like with the children of Israel when he told them, oh, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. And the Bible says he finally gave them a king. Yeah. And it set leanness under their souls. Yeah. So when God turns us over to our sins, he allows the full retribution mm -hmm. of whatever action that is meant to happen for us to ingest it. And we don't realize many times he's trying to keep us from that, but we, if we are persistent on it, eventually he'll give it us his way. So I'm going to use it. We talk about the Old Testament real quickly. Uh, the best story, I think, in the Old Testament of God giving it their way was um, Samson. There you go. Yeah. Uh, finally, the Bible, and I think it's the saddest scripture. People say, when does God turn it over, turn you over to it? The sad part is you won't know it. Yeah. You have been given so many opportunities to correct it that one day the Bible says, Samson said, I'll get up, shake myself mm -hmm. off as at any other time and did not know. The spirit of the Lord had departed from him. So yeah. God can leave right. your life and you'll not even know that he's that's, left. So yeah. that's the dangerous part about it. I think it's when we get to a point where we are no longer struggling. It is a, it's a conscious choice of I want this more than you, God, and I don't care about it. I know it's wrong. I know it, but I'm going to go after it anyways, and, and that's what does. God turns it over. It, gives it over. Yeah, Pastor Blaise. Well, you know, in, in Romans chapter 1, mm -hmm. you know, Paul talks about people that uh, had a knowledge of God and they rejected that knowledge mm -hmm. of God. And he says, even though they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind yeah. to do those things which are not unseemly. And so I think, you know, Jay kind of uh, hit it uh, precisely the fact that, you know, if you desire something, you desire something and, you know, and that begins to be a stronghold in your mind, then God just eventually let you have that in that reprobate mind. I, I looked up that word reprobate and it actually means a worthless mind. It means an unproductive mind. So, you know, people are given over to that and that is something that uh, ends up being their demise. It ends up being something that, that destroys them. But why does God give us, oh, why does he just keep trying to pull us, or trying to pull us in the right direction? He gave us free will. Okay. So in the midst of that free will, uh, uh, again, uh, they did. They 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 no longer acknowledged God. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of God turning on them. It's a matter of them turning on God. Yeah. And then finally, God said, "You yeah. know, I did every. What more can I do? You even see that in the Old Testament. What more Israel could I have done for you? Everything you needed, I provided. But yet right. you still. So it's not God. We can't put the emphasis is back on the will of man to be rebellious. Yeah, yeah, definitely free will figures in. Yeah, the Bible talks about um, God being slow to anger, God being long-suffering, uh, and His patience being great, but, but not infinite. Um, God's Spirit is not going to wrestle with man forever. Um, you know, the Gospel comes and, and God's revelation comes, and it's really, and I, I think you got at it, Dr. Glaze from Romans 1, right. you know, where you see they knew God, although they right. knew God. I mean, that was the they point. Changed. They knew Him. Yeah. It, they, they had something that was, was clear and they knew them. The invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things mm -hmm. that are made. And even though they knew God, they did not glorify Him. They were not thankful. They became futile. And, and it just keeps progressing, then professing to be wise. In the midst of rejecting God and becoming foolish, they said that was their wisdom. Mm -hmm. Our wisdom is to not know God. And so uh, they ch and then they changed the glory of God into an image, etc. And then finally, you know, verse 24, therefore God gave them over. You know, I mean, when they show themselves to be so hard, you see the same thing in, in Acts 7 when Stephen is, is preaching that sermon and he's about to be stoned for it and he goes through Israel's history, right? And he talks about our fathers would not obey. They rejected in their hearts. They turned back to Egypt. They said, make us gods. They made a calf. Then God turned and gave them over. You know, 
over and over and over again, and he gave them over to the worship of the, of the hosts of heaven. So it's, it's really a warning uh, to those of us who profess Christ that, you know, if we begin to trifle with sin or begin to think that, you know, well, we can do whatever because we're saved by grace and it doesn't matter, um, you know, you start to, to have that kind of antinomian attitude that, that really a reprobate mind, you know, and you show that, um, you know, God might just let you go. He might just, like you said, have it your way. Yeah. And when yeah. that happens, um, you know, there's no hope. Well, you know, the, I think you hit on something, Ray, and I want to come back to you for this because our next question is, does God get angry with us? So let's talk about that a little bit. You mentioned something about God's long suffering, but yeah. does God get angry with us? Yeah, uh, he does. Um, in, in a, I want to qualify it. There's a sense in which passions do not come upon God. God is perfect. There is no potentiality in God. God is perfectly, fully active. That's really what, what we understand by I am that I am, not that I will be someday. You know, we're going to grow up and, and be this. We're learning how to do this. God doesn't learn. God doesn't grow. God is perfect in everything, right? right. So there's a sense in which God's anger is always perfectly directed uh, towards, uh, towards sin and towards evil. He hates it perfectly. And yet, you know, the sinner can put himself into that. Um, and, and I think that's the way I understand it more than, you know, you, you don't want to think of God suddenly getting angry, the eternal, perfectly uh, content God. Uh, yeah, yeah, passion coming on him. That's not the way it is. It's an anthropomorphism. But we do have um, Psalm 7, God is a just judge. God is angry with the wicked every day. And, and, and then in Exodus 4, you know, some say, well, maybe that's the wicked. Well, there's a sense in which I think, um, you know, Jesus was angry with the disciples at mm -hmm. one point when they rebuke uh, the, the parents for bringing the children. It says he looked at them with the indignation. Not, not angry in the sense of a judge who's going to destroy, which is God to the wicked, but angry in the sense of a parent mm -hmm. who loves his child and wants better for them than that, right? Mm -hmm. I, and I see that like when, when God gets angry at Moses in, in Exodus 4. You know, Moses keeps making excuses. I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And you can just, just and, and so the Exodus 4. It almost 4, seems like he has a passionate moment there, well, though, yeah, doesn't it? Says, it? it As, says, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Yeah. Uh, and even in that language, you know, how you kindle a fire. Again, the, the, the anger of the Lord now is directed to Moses um, because Moses... Uh, is kept, you know, he keeps saying to God, no. But, but what, in what, what, what does God do? Is not Aaron your, the Levite your brother? I know he can speak well. So in his anger, God doesn't hurt Moses. Moses is yeah. his servant. He helps him. But, you know, uh, you know, sometimes we can bring, I think, ch chastisements on ourselves because God loves his yeah. children and he chastens them. Yeah, that is a very good point. Any other yeah, I, I think that, that the, you know, the love of God is, is the key and, and so, you know, I've always heard this to told, and I, I agree with everything that Ray said, but I've always heard this, that, that God is not angry at the person, he's angry at what they do. And, yeah. and so, you know, you, you kind of look at that and say, well, where's the balance at between that? Mm -hmm. and, and even Romans 1, uh, verse 18, the wrath of God is poured out against all unrighteousness. Yeah. So, you know, it, that, that kind of seems to support that, that God's anger, first and foremost, is with the deeds and, and not necessarily, he does get angry with people, so, but I think that his anger more is against what people do. And it's, a, it's such a holy thing, right? His anger, like our anger is almost never holy. That's right. that's a, that's <laughs> it, uh, really? Yeah. I mean, you're, you know, somebody cuts in front of you in line or something, you know, that's not holy anger, <laughs> Pastor Jay, but you know, uh, maybe it's righteous anger, I don't know. It's but, killing your flesh, yeah. that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Right, am I right, Pete? I mean, you're right. But, but, you're but right. for the most part, uh, what, but when God is angry, yeah. It's a righteous it's perfect. It, yeah, it's it is. Perfect. It's part of his perfections. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it, if perfect. God was not angry the way he is at evil, he wouldn't be perfect. There you yeah. go. But I think we see it a lot less in the New Testament because I think he's trying to show us something. Going back to the Old Testament, why is the Old Testament important? That's how he really views it. He really wants it, but Jesus took our anger on that cross. We can't forget about right. that. The Bible says the he's our propitiation, yeah. Yeah. For, which meant he averted the wrath. Now God is reaching out. That's why the yeah. good news has come in. The gospel the is now here because of that. So it's yeah. important that the anger is still there, but Jesus is like deflate. He's kind of like the sunscreen yeah. for this season yeah. for our lives, you know? Praise the Lord. We All did the wrath that. of God was poured out upon him on the cross. Amen. The wrath that was appointed for us. But That's we will right. get it if we don't receive him. There That's you go. Right. That's, That's right. right. Good discussion. Good discussion about an important topic. Well, coming up in 60 seconds, we ask what happens immediately when we die?
Welcome back to Hard Questions. We love answering your questions, especially our hotline question. Let's go to that one now. Is there anything in the Bible that states that we go into a dream form after we die? I heard another, I don't want to call him a pastor because he wasn't, and I don't want to say what I heard him heard. But anyhow, he said once we die, we go into the state of mind that we do whenever we dream. And I just wondered if there was anything biblical on that or if that was just his opinion. Thank you. God bless. Wow, that is a really interesting question, something I don't think I've ever heard. Pastor Bill, can you start us out on this Yeah, I'll, I'll start out. Uh, my uncle, who, who knew the Lord, uh, he passed away. And he was a member of the denomination. I'm not going to say yeah. it on, on air. But he was a member of a denomination. And my brother, also who's a minister, you know, they, we were asked to give remarks. And my brother got up and said, you know, I know that my uncle is in, in glory right now. I know that he's with the Lord. And, you know, he went on to talk about where my uncle was at. And as soon as my brother got finished, the pastor got up and he said, well, we know that this guy is not in heaven right now. He's uh, he's asleep in the grave, you know, and uh, he's uh, he's going to be awake. I mean, he really came out and corrected <laughs> wow. my brother after that. And, and, and so, you know, what, what she, I believe the question that she's asking, is there such a thing as soul sleeps? You know, that okay. when we die, you know, does our soul go to sleep? And at some future point, will there be a, re uh, a resurrection and we will, you know, be brought back to life again? Uh, you know, I would vehemently disagree with that doctrine. You know, mm -hmm. I, uh, and again, there's a lot of denominations that mm -hmm. teach soul sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, I always go back to Luke 16 when it talks about Lazarus and the rich man. Mm -hmm. And it talks about they both died. And it doesn't say they went to sleep. It said that Lazarus died and he went to Abraham's bosom, right. which, you know, there was still life. And it says that in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes. Mm -hmm. So there was awareness. You know, they, they weren't dreaming. You know, there was no sleep. But Im immediately after death, there was awareness on their part. Yeah. I, I think the King James Version talks about what's in First Thessalonians about uh, they that sleep, you know, uh, and it's, it's just a glorified word for dead. Yeah. dead yeah. De but again, the Bible says to be absent from the body immediately. The, the moment we take our last breath to be absent from the body for the believing one is to be present with the Lord. If you're not a believing one, you're not going to be present with the Lord. So you're going to go, to, there's only a, a smoking and non-smoking <laughs> residence. Be present with the Lord. Yeah. Well, that's what I think too, uh, when Jesus was on the cross, he told the one thief today, today. you'll today. be with me in paradise. So I think Jesus, obviously, wherever he went, um, which was paradise, uh, that thief went with him. Mm -hmm. But it's funny, I think one of the saddest parts of that story too, Jesus never said anything to the other guy. Yeah. He never even entertained anything he spoke. So that lets me know that you don't have to get into, you know, defending Jesus. It, it, he'll address when he needs to address. He addressed that guy, spoke to him, kept on preaching to his family. This guy's like, go ahead. Like they, what do they say today? They call them talking heads. And you got plenty of talking heads out there and Jesus just kept it moving. So I think it's important that we understand and that gives us assurance Dang. that we know that when we leave out of this life, mm -hmm. we are yes. immediately in the presence of the Lord. That's great. Yeah, Paul talks about departing and being with Christ. And right. he's which talking about, better. which is far better. And, and, and that's what he understood. When he died, he would go to be with Jesus. So the idea that, you know, you're in a dream state, which I would take the way you did, Dr. Glaze, that, okay, that's sleeping. And that's the doctrine of soul sleep, which is a, uh, a doctrine that uh, should be rejected mm -hmm. by all Christians. Mm -hmm. Because um, right now, I mean, I think there are so many verses that talk about that. Yes, you can find verses that say, like Paul says, we shall not all sleep. Right. But that's just like you said, Pete, it's a euphemism for death. Right. I mean, Jesus does that very clearly at Lazarus' tomb when he tells, you know, his disciples, oh, Lazarus is sleeping. And they think, oh, well, go wake him. And Jesus says plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> you know, so clearly the word sleep can mean dead. And that's, and that's what you should take those verses that, that talk about Christians sleeping it just means they're dead. But the reason why I think the apostles and Jesus use that, the, that word, because we will rise again. So there, mm -hmm. there's an interesting you know, meaning behind sleeping in the sense that a sleeping person will get up. Well, someday we're all going to rise again with new bodies. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, the moment we die, and I really want to say this to you know, whoever called in, because I know people struggle with this. Um, do not doubt that any loved one who, who was in Christ, like you there said, you Jay, you have to be in Christ, you have to be a believer. But if you die in faith, you go to be with Jesus immediately Amen. and it's Amen. better. 
Um, you're it. more alive. You're more knowing. There's no more sin clouding your brain, causing you to lust or be angry in a sinful way or anything like that. You're perfect. You're with Jesus. You have fuller understanding of all things. You can see the way things work out. They're not worried. They see God. They see everything's taken care of. And so they're with the Lord. And that's so important to know that the moment a believer dies, they're with the Lord. You don't Amen. sleep in the ground and, oh, my loved one's in the ground. No, they're with Jesus. I love that. And just, I just have to say this, you know, so, so often when we think about this dream state mm. or uh, heaven as, uh, you know, this ethereal place where everything's kind of wispy. No, it's the solid place. Yes. It's the place that's more solid than this Amen. earth. It's the place Amen. where the truth is stronger, where the colors are brighter, where mm. the, 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 our senses and our mind and everything is fully allowed to, to be what we were created mm. to be. That's the real place Amen. and the incredible place. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for, for your uh, thoughts here. It's uh, important. And thank you so much for your questions. Please send us your questions. So we'd like to end the program with a scripture. And today we go to 2 Peter, where it says this, the Lord is not mm. slack. Don't you love that? The mm. Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards mm. us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's 2 Peter 3, 9. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program. Trust in God. He loves you today.